Yeah. All right, Raghav, um, thanks. Please proceed. Okay, thank you very much to the uh, to the organizers for putting this through. So uh, I'm very, very happy to talk to you all today about kind of a sort of overview of our recent RIC results, uh, but not really an overview. That's why recent is, <laughs> is here in quotes and you'll see what I mean in the, in the rest of the talk. Uh, in, the, in the interest that this is a school with mostly uh, kind of junior people in, in our field, I kind of want to give you sort of where we were and where we are now kind of a picture, right? So RIC, is uh, stands for Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. It's in Long Island. So I am right now at Yale in Connecticut. So it's just across the water from us here. And you can see it started out with four main experiments. So there's STAR, Phoenix, uh, Phobos, and Brahms. Uh, right now, STAR is the only one currently taking data. Uh, Phoenix will convert to S Phoenix, which is a completely new detector, and it'll start taking data in a couple of years. So this is where we are now, right? So Rick has been running since uh, 2000. So basically, you know, from run one, which was 2000, to run 20, which was last year, right? It's really a completely versatile machine, right? You can see the species here that we can collide from proton, proton, all the way to uranium, uranium, and sort of different combinations in the middle, right? So asymmetric collisions from small systems to different species in the large systems to the isobar that was just done a few years ago. And the results are gonna come out very, very recently. Uh, uh, next month, they're gonna, they're gonna be released. And at a variety of center of mass energies. Right, so the x-axis here is the different center of mass energy. This is what we had till run 20. And the z scale here is sort of the integrated luminosities accumulated for each of the kind of the store uh, for at each run, right? So it's a co completely versatile machine that can do different center of mass energy, different species. And just last year, uh, just this year, we, we finished our run 21. So, Rick now is officially 21 years old in terms of data taking, so he can go grab a drink and relax, right? Because it was one of the most efficient runs that we have ever done in terms of data taking, right? So we had this, you can find this in our beam user request document from last year, where the first priority for data taking was fixed target at this 3.85 GeV center of mass energy. Right, so this was expected to take pretty much the entire period with a very large window, but we finished it on the order of 10 weeks, right? So that let us take a whole bunch of other runs that we had deemed lower priority and add this extra new uh, thing, which will make sense as I talk about later on. So we have oxygen on oxygen data. So that was actually not planned, but we decided to do it this year. So we have on the order of 200 million events, and this helps us study like the depth, like the you know, like the nuclear structure inside the oxygen nucleus, and also gives us a handle on the smaller systems, right? And the whole thing we have this beam beam energy scan too at RIG. So this is essentially completed now with overlapping energies at fixed target and collider mode, right? So you have a certain center of mass energy in collider mode versus fixed target mode. You have different you know, baryon stopping potentials in between the two, you have different kinematic range, you have different access to different particle production, right? So that gives you an idea of what we can actually study here. So I'm going to base my talk in kind of two broad sections, right? So I'll first talk about the soft probes, what we learn from there, kind of like the bulk properties of the medium. And the second part will be focused on the hard probes, which are, you know, high Q squared processes that, uh, learn about the, the kind of the transport properties of the QGP. So there are three main points I'm gonna talk about. So th this is by no means a comprehensive overview. We have 30 minutes, we, actually we have 25, right? So I cannot go through all the results. So I'm gonna pick and choose stuff that I think is quite cool and relevant for us to talk about in the context of Jetscape. So first to give you guys an idea of how we distinguish events in like heavy ion collisions, there's this thing called centrality, right? So realistically, when you collide these 
these uh, these nuclei, you can have a kind of impact parameter of the collision, kind of the distance between the two uh, center of the of the nuclei. You can call that impact parameter B, and you want to experimentally classify events where the impact parameter is very small or impact parameter is very large because you have different, you know, final state interactions that that happen for events that are different centrality classes, right? So the, the concept is very simple. You have an experimental observable where it has a broad enough dynamic range and you can essentially fit this to a globber, you know, geometry based model that you can divide events based on this observable into what we call most central, which is zero to 5% that roughly translates to very small impact parameter or most peripheral when the impact parameter is very large, right? So roughly two times the radius when you have kind of like these like grazing collisions. So in practice, what does this look like, right? So here you have very old publication from STAR. So this is from, this is from 2001. Uh, this should also be 2001, it's not 2011. So this is from Phobos. So these are some of the very early publications from, from Rick. You can see that this one here, uh, this is the number of negatively charged hadrons reconstructed in the tracks, right? In the time projection chamber. And you can see it has this nice broad distribution. And essentially what we see from Phobos is, is, is like a particle counter in their paddles. And they, you can also see the signal is, it's kind of called like this like horseback shape. So there's the horse's head and this is like the back of the horse, right? So this one here is the most central events. The ones here are the most uh, most peripheral events. So that's essentially what we mean by centrality is some observable experimentally that translates to a multiplicity. So the first physics thing we're gonna look at is this thing called anisotropies, right? So if you take your particle production you know, along the azimuthal plane, right? And you plot that, we can essentially fit it to a Fourier series. And even in this kind of figure, you can, you can already see that, you know, this second order, this, this V2 coefficient, this cos two phi, looks to be the one that is kind of dominant, right? But you also have other contributions. You have V1, V3, that come from like fluctuations of the initial state that can have like a triangular flow and you can extract all of these things, right? So let's look a little bit at, uh, uh, at our collector history, like, so where we started. So this is one of the first publications from, from STAR, right? That measured the V2, this is the coefficient as a function of essentially this is the ratio of the the charged particles in the event to the maximum. So it's like a ratio is kind of like the centrality, right? So you have most central on the right-hand side and peripheral in the left-hand side. And you can see the data V2 is maximum for like peripheral collisions when you have kind of smallish overlap. So you have this initial state anisotropy translating to, you know, to final state V2 here. And they also measured V2 as a function of the particle PT. And you can see that it kind of rises. Right, these boxes correspond to hydrodynamic calculations, and you can see that okay, so this rise is represented by your your um, hydrodynamic behavior. Another thing that was also done, and in the very beginning of Rick, was to to take these identified particles. So here you have a, a meson, and here you have a baryon, right? So you have the lambda and the k. You look at the number of constituent, you know, quarks, and you scale the v2 by that, right? So you're saying, okay, I have these particles. If I scale it by their constituents, what does the V2 look like? And here you see when they go to like, kind of like the high PT, they are essentially the same. Like if you didn't scale this, they, they would be off, right? So you can take a look at this publication that shows that scaling it gives you similar V2, right? So that tells us that the flow is technically happening at the state of these quarks that make up these, uh, these baryons and meson, right? So that, that tells us that we have this kind of fluid-like behavior of the quarks and gluons that in the initial, uh, uh, right, right after the collision, that you know, tells us we have this quark-gluon plasma. Right, so that's what we did in 2001, 2002-ish, right? So where are we at now? So just like a little bit of a, you know, like a time machine. This is one of a very recent uh, preliminary measurement from STAR 
Uh, and you will also hear about this type of correlations from, from Laura in the next talk. So this is looking at V2 as a function of mean PT. So you take, we saw that it has a, a dependence on the PT. You actually study the correlation for different species, right? So you here we look at gold, gold in the blue markers. And we looked at uranium, uranium in the red markers, right? And uranium has this funny geometry, right? So it's like very highly massive object. So when, it, when you boost it to that uh, beam energy, it's not completely flat, right? It has this kind of like football-like shape. And as a result, you can have three different kinds of collisions. You can have this kind of, you know, long side uh, maxes on, on, on each other, or you can have these like tips of the football colliding, or you can have like, you know, this like the other side. And what this correlation tells us, right, is if you look at uranium, there is a negative correlation for the most central events compared to gold gold, which has a positive correlation, right? And you can see it quantified in this Pearson coefficient rho. So if rho is positive, that means the correlation is, is positive. Rho is negative, that means you have this like negative slope. And the main takeaway from this, right? This is a very kind of new measurement. There's a lot of understand, there are a lot of physics that go into making this individual correlations. And we expect this to be sensitive to kind of the deformations of the nuclei, right? That tells you what is the, in terms of the collision, what is the PT of the particles that, that, that kind of comes out. And you the, the kind of take home message here, if you look at V2, all these shaded regions are different like hydro calculations, right? And none of them describe the data. Right. So this is an, an, an exciting place where you have, okay, here's data. It's not described by your, by your model. So now you can take your, you know, for example, you can take the Jetscape framework. You can see the data here and you can, you know, do the Bayesian study and come up what, what kind of parameters do I have to include? Maybe some, some deformation parameter. There's this like beta here that you can see. Do I have to tune that to get some value, right? So this is an ex exciting area moving forward. So I want to mention this because it's kind of new and it's 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 like happening right now is is looking at flow in small systems, right? So there was this very nice paper from uh, Phoenix that was a, a couple of years ago published in Nature, where they looked at three different collision systems: so proton on gold, deuteron on gold, and helium three on gold. And the idea is that this kind of initial geometry, right? So this proton is kind of like a point object, and the deuteron has this like two structure, right? And then the uh, helium has this kind of three blob structure. So you can, you can expect a different value of like, you know, this V2 and V3. And they showed that this, this, this difference, you look at the open circle points here from uh, Phoenix for the three different systems. You see the, the, the V3 is significantly larger for the helium three. And this was like, okay, this is coming from the, the like initial condition. And there's this like flow. So they said, okay, so we have like QGP droplets here. So STAR also did the same measurement, right? And they said that, oh, look, our V3 for helium, gold, deuteron gold, and proton gold, roughly similar, right? And there's like, okay, so now there's significant disagreement you can see here in the ratio. And the question is how to study this further. So there was a group of people put together at RIC to like look at this in more detail. And there's a new measurement that uh, that came out from uh, from uh, from Phoenix that was put on the archive a few days ago, and from Ron Belmont and uh, Jamie Nagel and others to to talk about this in a lot more detail. But essentially, what's what's happening, right, is that there are different rapidity coverages in the experiments, right? So Phoenix ended up correlating this kind of forward going. Uh, uh, quantities from their like trackers and the beam beam counters at what what they had at mid rapidity with a different acceptance and star was originally only looking at mid rapidity right so this is exactly why this year if i go back to my slide in the very beginning we took data at the very end of our run we took deuteron gold with an enhanced acceptance because now we have the, the ITPC, we have the event plane detector. So now we have pretty much similar coverage as uh, Phoenix and we can redo this measurement with that same like condition, right? So this is now you know kind of an interesting use case for a framework such as Jetscape, right? So where you have this event production, 
you can look at different rapidity and you can you can and it's it's the same it's the same heavy ion event right depending on where you look at the correlations you look at forward kind of like the longitudinal axis or you look at only mid rapidity which is more connected to like the, the transverse uh, uh, part of the event you you can get different results right so it's not like one is wrong there's just more to learn in this case so just a couple more points on this bulk properties before I move on. One is something that we are working on in, in STAR, uh, which is look at the multiplicity fluctuations and especially with our beam energy scan uh, two results, right? So we know from our statistical mechanics that if you have a phase transition, the lens scale associated with that phase transition, especially when you go towards higher order and you go towards this like critical point, the lens scale associated with the process essentially blows up at the phase transition, right? So the way we study that in data is to look at fluctuations in the multiplicity distribution. So here we look at the proton multiplicity distributions and we look at higher order moments of that distribution. And there are some theoretical calculations. You can look at the re reference here that say that if you look at the kurtosis, which is like the fourth order fluctuation, right? you'll find this non-monotonic behavior as you cross this kind of critical region, right? And this is a, called as a possible signature of the critical point. Here you can see our data from, run, uh, from the beam energy scan one and the scan two, which we just finished, will significantly reduce these uncertainties. You can see kind of hints of this non-monotonous behavior, but the, but the uncertainties are large. And so we have to you know, use the new data and have a, you know, clear result in this. So last part of my bulk physics is to look at something that's also quite new, right? And it's been like kind of revolutionizing the field is to look at this global polarization and vorticity, right? So there's this paper from, from Star a few years ago that is a, a nature article that looked at the global polarization of the uh, lambda baryon, right? So the idea is that you have these kind of two beams coming and colliding, right? So when they interact, you have this like spectator particles, right? And then you have the participants. So there's what ends up is this kind of large like angular momentum transfer between the two colliding nuclei, right? So that results in this like L going up and that also creates a magnetic field, right? So as a result, you end up creating these kind of spinning tops of these like small areas of, of like polarization and as a result the particles produced like the lambda particles that are produced end up having global polarization so we can measure that with this uh with this uh, uh function here where psi one is like the reaction plane angle uh and you can see as you go to lower center of mass energy this polarization effectively grows right as you go to very large center of mass energy, this has also been measured in in at least they are roughly consistent with zero for particle and like antiparticle if you if you combine it together, but even at 200 GeV we observe non-zero polarization and as a result you can get like a thermal velocity from this if you if you if you calculate it. So STAR has measured this completely differentially for different center of mass energy as a function of PT rapidity, also for different particle species like you can look at the sky and the omega going to the daughter lambda polarization, they are also, if you look at the red star markers, they are non-zero, right? If you go to the higher ones, the uncertainties are very large, but you know, this is kind of like the state of the art in this field now. So that's the first part of the talk, right? So let's go to the second part of the talk. I, I forgot to say, I don't have the Slack in front of me here. So if there's any questions, uh, so I asked one of the organizers to like, please let me know. So then we can we can go like over it. All right. So now we come to the second part of the talk, which is to look at hard probes, right? Where we want to study the quenching of these like colored probes that come from high Q squared processes that enables us to learn about the the uh, the transfer properties of the medium. And then we, I'm also coupling the. Uh, heavy flavor part to this because they're also produced in like the hot scattering and they can be used as thermometers and also study this thing that we that we talked towards the end of Sangyang's talk, which is like coalescence and stuff. So in line with the with the theme of the talk, let's let's look let's look at 
history of what was done, right? So the first paper to come out from both the collaborations, like Phoenix and Star, well, it's like the third paper actually, is to look at this thing called the RAA. So it's a nuclear mo modification factor. And you can see the formula here is essentially the yield of particles in gold gold divided by PP, which is like the reference scaled with some number it's it's that comes from the number of binary collision right so if i have a gold gold if you think of it as you know some number of nucleons let's say like you know 200 something nucleons and you're like colliding it and you're scaling this number with the proton so it's kind of like a superposition principle is gold gold just a scaled up pp right and if this ratio is one then you know that okay scaling works if the ratio is less than one, you know there's suppression, you know there's like basically emergent phenomena that is interfering with this ratio being one. If it's greater than one, same thing. You have extra cold nuclear matter physics that increasing it. So Mike, I just saw you come on. Is there a question? Not a question, just a reminder that you just have a couple of minutes left. Ah, okay, so I'll get there. So you, we, we have the RAA as a function of PT, and this is for charge, uh, uh, this is basically for pions, and you see that the RAA is less than one, right? So there is a suppression. And then the question you can ask is, okay, where are they suppressed? So here, there was a measurement from STAR that looked at this delta phi. So here's the trigger particle is at zero. You look at all the particles uh, around it in phi, and you notice that the suppression is exactly happening at the back-to-back -back in delta phi. Right, you see the red, the, the blue markers is gold, gold compared to the small systems. And there's absolutely nothing going on in the back-to-back -back region. So, so this is an important key thing I want to I want you to take away is it's not only enough to look at suppression as a function of PT, you also need to look at it in terms of an angle and exactly where it's it's like it's like happening. So we get into a time machine, we come to current stand, we look at jets, so we don't look at single particles. A lot, we reconstruct them into jets, which go back to your hard scattered quark or gluon. Here you can see the spectra. It's significantly steeper at RIC compared to the LHC. And jets essentially are an algorithmic proxy for your parton. And you can see measurements from STAR in PP collisions that look at the jet spectra. So this is a preliminary measurement. And also the jet substructure observables. And I point this out because I know that Jetscape has a PP tune, right? So there's a PP tune at like the LHC, the paper came out a couple of years ago. Here's data from Rick. So I expect a PP tune for Rick energy sometime soon, right? So here's the data. So in terms of jet quenching at Rick, so here we have the RCP, which is the ratio of the central to the peripheral. And you can see the jets in the, in the solid markers compared to the open markers with charge hadron. From that, the takeaway is that we can get this delta PT, which is like the energy loss that happens to your jets. And it's roughly consistent to be around two to four GeV at break compared to the LHC, which is the last one here, which is around a factor of two to three higher, right? That tells us there's the indication of this like absolute smaller energy loss at break, but the relative one is then, is then higher. So just a minute or two, Mike, I just want to finish this like heavy flavor stuff. So heavy flavor is quite interesting for a couple of purposes, right? So it tells us if you have particles produced like the charm or the bottom quark that are coming from like the hot scattering, you can study the energy loss as a function of the, the mass of the quark. And you can also see at the very end of the time scale, what happens to these mesons that are coming out of your like heavy flavor particles. Is there a difference in their production? Are they affected by like the thermalization, et cetera? So yes, uh, yeah. So in, let's first start very quickly with with quarkonia. Quarkonia is just a, a quark and an antiquark. So it forms a pair. It's like the meson, right? It can be used as like a temperature probe because they are binding energy. If you put them in a system that has a bath, uh, like a thermal temperature larger than the binding energy, then they essentially dis disassociate. Right. So by looking at their suppression, so here's the JSI RAA for Rick in the in star, which is the red markers compared to Alice, which is the blue markers. You can see that their suppression is significantly larger at star compared to Alice. Right. So there's like a couple of compounding factors 
that we have a smaller charm cross section, and then there's also regeneration happening at DLHC because the temperature is like higher. And you can look at this kind of sequential suppression, right? So you look at the higher mass states, you look at you know, psi 2s, or you can look at upsilons. And the main takeaway is there is sequential suppression, right? So that gives us an idea about like the temperature of the system. And we've also studied this in cold nuclear matter. So this is now D gold. And you see that the, that the cold nuclear matter effects are not negligible, right? This, this ratio is less than one. You can see this from both star and in uh, Phoenix. So this is something important that needs to be taken into account. So this really is the last slide. Uh, we look at the ratio of the charm and the bottom quarks. Uh, you can see here, this is the, essentially it's like a double ratio of the RCP. The blue markers correspond to like central and the red is like the semi-central. So it's bottom over charm. And this ratio is not one. Right? And you can see it's reproduced by this like Duke model that includes the mass dependence. Right, So th there is significant mass dependence of this suppression. And you also have kind of flow uh, uh, V2 of these like non-photonic electrons that is quite significant. So anyway, that's really the last slide and I'm done. So the, you can see we separated it out into soft and like heavy probes. Uh, so please ask me any questions. Okay, we're open for questions, if anyone has any. I see a question by Roloff. Yes. Um... Uh, I, I was wondering about this this uh, uh, this vortical fluid. This so, uh, if I understand this correctly, you have this peripheral collision, and this then kind of gives your QTP. Uh, it gives it an angular momentum. Yeah. Um, but but how exactly did you uh, measure this in the final state? Right. So you basically look at the. Uh, lambda particle right so you basically reconstruct the, the the lambda using the proton and the pion and the idea is that the proton carries the bulk of the the that like it's going in like the direction of the lambda so you plot this observer which is like the mean of the sign difference between the reaction plane angle and the and the and the daughter essentially proton and you find out that this is sensitive to like the polarization. So if they're all pointing in like, you know, they're, they're, they're all like spinning in like one direction, you'll find this to be non-zero. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there, there's, a very nice, there's a very nice diagram in like the star paper. So you should, you should go take a look at that, yeah. Next Isabel, question is from Isabel. Um, so I was just wondering about this um, gold gold fixed target run that you said you did. Was the data taken there with STAR? Which experiment um, took the data? Yeah, so STAR is the only running detector right, right, ex experiment right now. So Phoenix stopped taking data in 2016 or 17, I want to say. And then S Phoenix will start two years later, 23. So basically the beam energy scan is all done by STAR. Okay, so in this beam, the rapidity of the beam in this sort of fixed target is still falls within the rapidity acceptance of star then, so you can take useful data. Is this with the new, the, the new detectors all the way out right. at higher yeah. rapidity? That's fine. Right. So we have the uh, uh, we have the inner TPC and the fixed target is so the so the target is not in the middle of the uh, detector, right? It's towards the it's towards one edge of the detector. So when you have a collision, basically the detector cap captures everything coming out of it. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, and you will hear about S Phoenix and the future of Rick in uh, Dave's talk, I think at end of next week, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so that, that's what I said, this S Phoenix and Star Forward. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Raghav for a great talk and
and yeah, get the thank next you. speaker up. Thanks, Rago. Yeah, bye.